Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast Extra, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. The Tough Girl Podcast Extra is when we go back and catch up with previous guests to see what they've been up to since we last spoke with them. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be catching up with Wendy Searle, an adventurer, mother of four, and the seventh woman to ski solo and unsupported from Hercules Inlet to the South Pole. My name's Wendy Searle. I'm 42 and this year I'll be 43 and I have four kids and a full-time job and the last time I was on the podcast I talked about my aspiration to ski solo to the South Pole and it was just such a massive thing and I can't remember exactly where I was in my journey to just getting to the start point but it's been almost five years so by the time I stood at the South Pole in January, on January the 8th this year, it's, it's, it's taken me five years to plan and train and raise the money and juggle everything so probably when I spoke to you last it might have felt to me like it was I was never going to get the money you know everything was all kind of seemingly impossible but everything did come together at the last moment sort of two weeks before I flew to Antarctica I paid the bill and uh, I started by some kind of miracle of hard work persistence luck generosity of sponsors I was standing at the start line in back in November so yeah it actually did all happen and I can hardly believe it myself oh it's incredible absolutely incredible and a massive massive congratulations on making it to the South Pole we spoke to you in August and we heard more about you know your goals what you're attempting to do your planning your preparation your your funding your life your background and adventures you know all of that stuff so if you haven't listened to the first episode go and give that a listen to I'd love for you to take us back to Two, you know, two weeks before the start line, two weeks before you were heading off to the South Pole, what was happening? Was it all organised? Was it calm? Or was it chaos? Can you take us back to, to that time? It was absolutely definitely not calm. It was right down to the wire in terms of getting everything organised. And because the bill was payable in dollars and the whole Brexit crisis was happening, every single day that I woke up and the dollar was 50 cents uh, better against the pound it was 500 pounds more expensive and so I was in this vicious circle where I was trying to get the money together but I couldn't pay the money to pay the bill until I had all the money and every day that I woke up it was more expensive so then I couldn't pay the bill again and so it was it was a really difficult time in terms of the expedition and it was absolutely touch and go right until sort of two weeks before one of the amazing sponsors came forward and said look we will cover the shortfall and and pay the bill but sort of there and then and then All that was left to do was kind of tight loose ends at work. I flew to South America to then fly on to South to Antarctica. I think it was the day after I finished work. So everything was just, you know, I was kind of running around trying to do all of those things and make sure everyone at work was happy, make sure the kids were settled. And because my husband's amazing at lots of things, but he probably isn't the best at Christmas present buying. So I bought everybody's Christmas presents before I went and and had them all done by the end of October, all sort of neatly assigned. So there was a lot to do. It wasn't, definitely was not a matter of, you know, walking out the door and getting on a plane and and the expedition happening. It was, it was definitely all sort of last minute, but it did all come together. It must have been a bit of a relief actually to almost get on the plane and just relax. In a funny kind of way it was because as soon as I got on the plane there was that was all I had to think about. I didn't have to think about all those other things. Not having to fundraise for it was just a massive weight off my mind. It felt quite odd really like like when you finish your A-levels and you don't quite know what you're supposed to be stressed about anymore. But then I'd spent such a lot of time thinking about how to make the exhibition happen that I perhaps hadn't thought as much as I could have done maybe about what it was actually going to be like. And I think it's very much like having kids or getting married something like that you think a lot about having a baby and the birth or you think about the wedding day you perhaps don't think about you know the the bit after that so I was so focused on getting to the start line it wasn't until I got on the plane and then spent some time in in South America for a week or so prepping my kit that I had an opportunity to really think about the expedition itself so that definitely took up a lot of my my sort of thinking time and it, it felt very busy even even though all I had to do in that week was prep my food take us over to South America were, were there were you going out with like other people was it just you you know being dropped off on the ice like how did it work with with like the plane and the transport over to Antarctica it's a, an amazing operation but you can't just 
get on a plane to Antarctica, you've got to go through either as an expedition or as a scientist and there aren't any scheduled flights so you have to go through the logistics company and it was a logistics company called ALE and they have a setup in South America where you go in and all your kit is weighed to go on the plane they take you through the process and and then you get a boarding card just like you would on a normal flight but the boarding card is a really nice sort of thick card and it's got the the logo on and that was just such a special moment and that kind of made me realize that yes I am going to go and do this and even talking to you now about it makes me feel quite emotional because they handed me this boarding card and I'd been down to the same place Punta Arenas four times before then maybe supporting other expeditions and I said I said to myself the last time I left I am not coming back here unless I'm getting on that plane myself and they handed me the boarding card and I just burst into tears because it was just all that work that had gone into getting to that point you know one of the most exclusive and difficult to uh difficult to get hold of boarding cards in the world so but there were lots of other expeditioners a couple of scientists a group of scientists going down and you all go in and have a briefing at the office before you get on the plane and the idea is it's a lot about antarctic wildlife making sure you don't take anything like seeds in your backpack or anything like that that could upset the biodiversity of the of the continent there were a couple in front of me who were going to the penguin camp and it just sounded so amazing so they go to you go to a penguin camp and see some amazing emperor penguins and and you're not allowed to approach them but they inevitably approach you because they're such curious creatures and you know you get to photograph them and it just sounded amazing I thought I really want to swap with you guys I do (laughs) that sounds much nicer than what I'm about to uh, to set off and do but um it was all part of the experience. So, uh, yeah, we were pretty well looked after and we all hung out together before we, we flew into Antarctica. And then you hang out together as well at a logistics base that you fly into. And then everyone's kind of held there until their their internal flight of a little ski plane is ready to take you off to the to the start point of, uh, of your particular expedition or event. And uh, I got off the plane and um, there were two other groups with me, one soloist and one guided group. And I definitely pretended to fiddle with something very important in my kit waiting just to check which way they were going off to make sure I didn't like embarrass myself and ski off in the wrong direction because I was like so what one of the things I was worried about and there were so many things you know I just didn't want to get it wrong I didn't want anything to you know bad to happen and and so it was quite funny because I was just kind of uh yeah hanging hanging at the back and then I knew where I was going but it was nice to have it confirmed by somebody else that is really one of the most difficult and challenging and satisfying things about it is that you don't have that you don't have anybody else to confirm your decisions you you don't have anyone you completely have to trust your own judgment and it's a very weird feeling not something that we do very often and because you know even if you kind of know the answer to something you still tend to talk it through with somebody but there was no one to say you know what do you think should we stop here for the night do you think it's over that way the wind's getting up do you think it's a good time to you know stop now because there's a storm coming or should we go another hour only you can make those decisions it's quite a big thing but actually having done that there's a lot of self-belief that I have now that I definitely didn't have beforehand. Did your start date go ahead as planned or were there any weather conditions that you need to be aware of was there anyone to see you off were you, were you flown off like how did that like the actual start when it was like right off you go three two one boom yeah, there's no kind of ready, steady go. But the, uh, the I think we had a bit of a delay getting into the Antarctica in the first place. But then conditions were good. You spend a couple of days in the logistics base called Union Glacier and you get your DPS all checked. You pick up your fuel because you can't fly with that. Travel safety check that you kind of understand how to use all the comm stuff. And it's very well kind of governed. All the checks you have to go through are really thorough. And then they say, right, you're ready to go whenever you want want to go. I think I'd spent 24, 36 hours at Union Glacier on the way out. And then they fly you into the start point, a place called Hercules Inlet. And there literally is, you know, absolutely nothing there that you can, that I guess you could sort of tell you're on an ice sheet, not the continent because it's so flat. But yeah, there's no, there's no kind of, when your marks get set, go. There's no medal at the end. So you're a couple of kilometres from the start point when they drop you off just to ins- absolutely ensure that you're on the ice shelf and no one can say you've kind of started inland from the continent. And then you call the lo- logistics team. And I just said, right, I'm, you know, start the clock, I'm, I'm off. And then you eventually call them again when you get to get to pole and uh, they, they then stop the clock. So obviously I was aiming for the record, uh, which is currently held by an amazing 
amazing polo traveler called Johanna Davison, who's just the nicest, nicest person. And uh, she was actually in Union Glacier Camp when I was there. And she was absolutely rooting for me. I'm sure she'd have been so happy if I'd made the record. She's kind of really humble and just super nice. And she just gave me a massive hug and said, we'll all be cheering for you. And then I was crying again because it was, you know, it was just so kind of open of her. And, you know, I think she'd have been really happy to have seen me do it. But um, she is a bit of a ninja and it it does make you realise, you know, it's really hard. It is really hard. And, you know, you, you can do all the training and tyre hauling and anything else that you like. But actually being out there and hauling I think I was 86 kilos of sled weight at the, at the start and doing that for however many days alone and making all those judgments and trying to judge it just right so that you don't run out of food but you don't completely thrash it to, too much in the beginning and then you run out of energy or you know and getting all that right and the total focus that you've got to have every single moment of every single day the only time when you can't be fully concentrating is when you're asleep so you're always focusing on are you warm enough are your extremities warm enough is your body cool enough because any build up of sweat can freeze and then cause you to be super chilled have you got the early signs of hypothermia is your face frostbitten have you got any other injuries are you going the right direction you know how are you doing for time and there's so much to think about And there's never a time when you're switched off. As soon as you get into the tent and you're thinking about cooking your dinner without burning the tent down, calling back to the logistics company, doing your blog without running out of energy for your sat phone. So that total focus, you don't kind of realise at the time. And it's it's a very pure existence, but actually you don't realise how exhausting it is until you finish and you look back and you think, actually, you know, that was that could have been pretty sketchy at various points but at the time you don't think about that because you're so in the moment and you're so you're concentrating so hard on all of those other aspects what was like one of the scariest points or those dodgy points where you think oh my god I can't believe that happened or I can't believe I got through that so I'm so happy that all my training and all my preparation really really paid off so I know everyone thought I was totally bonkers that I was training so hard and for so long that I'd trained so thoroughly I was so methodical about everything like some people call it a bit anal I mean it was just like every single thing I did in exactly the same way every single day I got up at the same time every day my lighter was always in my exactly the same jacket pocket so it never got so cold it wouldn't like the the cooker I plugged into my headphones exactly the same way every day and that kind of helped me cope with the distance and the time but there were there were still a few moments, and that was more down to the conditions that, um, than anything else. And there was a storm on day three or four, I think. And you dig your tent down, so you you kind of big a dig a big sort of area for your tent so that it's lower than um, the level of the snow. And I used what I dug out to build a snow wall, one that any kind of Yorkshire dry stone waller might have been proud of, and uh, that protects the tent from the worst of the the wind. But then you get these vortexes of snow around it just naturally because of you know I'm not a scientist but and it builds up around the tent and having been in Greenland when we had quite a serious issue with the tent that collapsed in a similar similar weather conditions I was convinced I was going to get buried alive and it was it was quite a it was a long night that uh and and I phoned my expedition manager saying you know I this is actually quite scary and uh, he said, don't worry, don't worry, it'll, you know, it'll get to a certain point and it won't get any higher. And uh, it was, it was, it sets like concrete. So you're trying to kick it away from the side of the tent and it, you just, it's so, it's so kind of, you, you wouldn't think it, but it was impossible to kick away. So I thought if it gets any, any higher, you know, I'm either going to have to get out and dig this out or, you know, that's it, I'm, I'm done for already. But sure enough, in the morning, he, he was absolutely right. It was halfway up the tent and it took me two and a half hours to dig it out. But it was completely, you know, safe. And after that, I was I was kind of in love with my tent, which I called the Wally Herbert, who's a, an Arctic explorer from the kind of 50s and 60s. And, uh, you know, I was just like, I can't believe this tiny bit of canvas and these couple of tent poles could keep me safe from all these conditions out here. And it was just the best moment of every day, kind of fall, falling into the tent at the end of, you know, an 11, 12 hour skiing day and um, if it's sunny it can actually be really warm inside the tent I was just kind of basking in it thinking oh you know thank god I've done another day and then there was there were a couple of moments when it was more daunting than frightening I would say I met uh, Molly Hughes who's a Scottish girl who's now the youngest 
over to a skied solo to the South Pole. And I saw her around Christmas Day. I think it was just after. And it was really great, but the weather was terrible. So we didn't kind of hang around to, to chat. And I, I still don't know what she looks like because I've only ever met her when she's covered in uh, goggles and mask and hood and, you know, all the rest of it. And so we said a quick hello and wished each other well. I skied off and I looked back an hour later on my on my break and there was this just this tiny little person who was kind of bent against the wind. She looked like she was really kind of putting a major effort in. She was moving so what looked so sm- slowly that it looked like, you know, you were never going to make any progress. And she looked so vulnerable. And I, so I stood and looked at her and I thought, oh, my God, that's how I look. That's how I am. I'm that vulnerable little speck in the middle of nowhere, bent against the wind, making no progress every day. And for a couple of days after that, it kind of messed with my head a bit. It sort of upset my equilibrium because I felt like I was making progress. I felt like, you know, the sort of landscape changed every day and that I was moving towards a, a defined goal. But it just felt so suddenly that I was just really isolated and it really hit me. But the rest of the time, it was kind of, I don't know whether some people might think of it as quite boring, actually, but I was so consistent in the number of miles that I did every day. You had to ring in every every night at a specified time. And they'd say, oh, you know, how many miles have you done? How many hours have you skied? Uh, any gear issues? And it was always the same. It was always I'd done about 15 nautical miles, which is 17, 18 miles, about 30 kilometres every day, even in sort of whiteout days or when the conditions weren't great, which is surprising, actually, but, but you know, kind of pleasing. And no, I didn't have any gear issues. No, I didn't have any med- medical issues. So they're probably thinking, you know, this is just not a very interesting uh, expedition but I'm just I'm actually quite relieved that uh, you know that kind of all the training and being so methodical kind of saw me through but it was actually the I would say that the physical training I was expecting it to be hard and it was as hard as I was expecting but it was the mental challenge without question that was the hardest thing so I was worried about so many things skiing off in the wrong direction or or kit failure or just doing something stupid and everyone going oh what a prat we knew that you know you couldn't do it and uh, actually, it was the mental challenge of the relentlessness of, of getting up and facing another day in those conditions. And when I got out of the tent in the morning and I was heading towards my campsite at the end of the day, I was I was fine then. But in the mornings trying to get out of the tent, I was, you know, for the first sort of three, maybe four weeks even out of the six weeks I was out there, I was just crying in my tent every morning thinking this is just hideous. I really don't want to get out and do another day. And I finished skiing at the end of every day and I was so done. I was putting my tent up on my hands and knees and I'd be thinking, how on earth am I going to get up and do that all again the next day? But somehow you do. And it's just it's absolutely amazing what the body and mind is capable of. And, you know, I'm still kind of pretty thankful that that they both got me through. Tell us more about handling the the isolation and and dealing with the mental challenges that, that are thrown to you in such an extreme environment. I was worried I was going to feel lonely and I was worried that I was going to feel alone. And I really didn't. And I can't explain to you why that is, because I, that is definitely one of the things I was concerned about. I had lots of audio books, but, you know, I didn't see I saw four humans the whole you know, 42 days and I didn't see a single other living thing. But there was I don't I, and I can't explain it even now that there was something I just I really felt all the support from home. I knew how much people were willing me on. You know, I was pretty I was pretty content in my own company for, for, you know, most of the time during the day. Again, the mornings were the hardest thing and I miss my kids so much. And I I don't know whether I sort of projected it onto the fact that I miss my kids and that kind of was what I was fixated on or whether I really genuinely missed them or it was just, you know, that, that it was so tough. That was what I kind of focused on on, on the reason for it. I was sending them messages, you know, I just miss you. I miss them so terribly. And I just kept thinking, you know, the, the quicker you ski, the sooner you get there, the sooner you'll see your family again. And I had these great visualizations. Sometimes I'd kind of go back to them on subsequent days, but I had this great visualization about this amazing family holiday we were going to go on and what the villa was going to be like and what we were going to do each day. And it was going to be super warm. And I was quite fixated on this idea of eating tea and toast and sitting in front of the fire with my kids watching rubbish telly and uh, you know you can have that when you get to the finish so I mean I, I don't know whether that helped me cope but my I suppose I the routine helped me cope being methodical helped me cope and I had written inside my tent all these little sayings and sort of inspirational things that were supposed to help me kind of get out of my tent and and so some of them were things like just one day at a time and instead of you know when you're in prison and you do a sort of um, a tally with you know four lines and a gate across it or like you might have done in school to kind of count down the days 
because they do all blur into one. The only way I kind of really knew what day I was on was because I'd written all the correct numbers on my food rations for every day. So I knew sort of where I was. But I did um, a heart instead for every day that I was out there. So there's all this. And I just got I took a Sharpie and I, I wrote messages to myself stop crying start skiing was one of them <laughs> I asked lots of expeditioners friends for their advice and their little sayings that, was, that have helped them and wrote all that was on the inside of my tent and probably my favorite is one by a Norwegian and polar guide and the Norwegians can be very dry but sort of have to have hidden depths and uh, I said what's your advice he said we'll just keep skiing and uh, it sounds kind of it sounds crazily simple, but actually that's probably one of the ones that helped me most because in the at the end of the day, what else are you going to do? You know, you want to get to a a certain point. You've just got to keep going. And uh, there were all sorts of other ones as well. But um, so my mental coping strategies were looking at those and kind of having those in my head. I did a power pose to the sun. There's some study about power poses where you sort of kind of stand like a superhero or with your hands on your hips, and just doing that apparently can improve your success at things, improve your mental resilience. I don't know why, but I thought I'm going to give this a try. You know, they can't do any harm. And if it works, then great. So I did a power pose to the sun every morning. I spent a lot of time kind of messaging my kids and that, that really helped as well. So I had GPS linked to my phone and I'd get into the tent at night and switch everything on and all the messages would start pinging in from my family. And uh, that was massively helpful as well. How important was the record to you? And when did you realise that you weren't going to break the record it was important to me from the point of view of being authentic to my sponsors so that was the premise on which I'd gone to them and said this is what I'm planning to do and there was no way that I could have you know lived with myself if I'd gone there and thought oh well you know forget that I'm here now I'm gonna do my own thing and have a nice time that was absolutely my intention from day one and the only thing I would say about it was that I know that I did absolutely every, everything I could every single day and there was nothing else that I could have given so and that was always how I kind of viewed it in my head I never thought well you've got to do x miles every single day to do it even though I kind of knew that because all I could do was what the conditions allowed what my body and mind would allow and you know give it everything every single day I know that I did that so probably kind of around halfway I knew that it would be really tricky to get the record at that point and I was actually surprisingly okay about that because I knew that, you know, it was, it was hard enough. It was, you know, literally so much harder than I was expecting. The hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And uh, just to have conquered another day felt like I'd, I'd won. So actually to arrive at the pole and, and be sort of three days off, I was, I was more than satisfied. You know, not happy, but I was satisfied that I'd done everything that I possibly could. Tell us what it was like when you you achieved your your dream and you turned that dream that idea into an actual reality and you're stood at the south pole and actually it wasn't the moment that I reached the south pole I know exactly because I looked at my GPS and it was 9.7 nautical miles out from the south pole so that's still a considerable distance it was still let's say 10 11 12 hours skiing away I saw this speck in the distance over to my right and everything in Antarctica if, if there's something man-made even if it's you know a tiny gps or a tent or something you can see it for miles away because everything stands out you know there's nothing man-made so you really you can really notice things and i saw this little dot on the horizon it just looked like um how a child would draw a submarine because it is a long building with um some radars and things and sort of masks coming off it and i saw it over to the right and at the time i was listening to an audiobook danny the champion of the world which i'd saved all my other audiobooks I'd ended up listening to loads of times because I'd miscalculated how how much I'd want to listen to them and, and I'd, I ended up running out on sort of day 20, but I kept that one for the last day. It was a, a moment in Daniel the Champion of the World that's an amazing moment and I saw the South Pole out of the corner of my eye and it wasn't until that actual second, that moment, that I was sure that I was going to make it because so many things can go wrong so quickly. You can, you know, you can get hypothermia and it can go wrong and I just was never complacent I never thought oh well this is in the bag I never thought well I'm you know within the last 60 nautical miles the last degree I'm going to make it I never ever assumed that I was going to be okay that I was going to make it until I saw it and I thought I know I'm going to make it and all of the five years of planning and training and sacrifice and effort and fundraising and just just graft and all the 42 days of the expedition and how tired I was and I'd lost quite a lot of weight. You know, I was hungry. I was pretty tired and exhausted. 
And all of that was just telescoped into this one moment of seeing the South Pole and thinking, I'm going to make it, I'm going to do this. And I can't tell you, you know, the emotion and, and the relief and just the crying. And when I actually got to the South Pole, it was, it was a slight anticlimax because you ski into this camp that's actually set a little bit away from the South Pole. And the South Pole actually is a sort of stripy pole with a big ball on top, just like you imagine it might be. And you ski into the a sort of tented camp that's a kilometre away and then you ski down to the South Pole. And, and I was I was just absolutely on my knees. I've been skiing for 12 hours. Then I put my tent up and then skied another uh, 10, 11 hours to make sure that I didn't run out of food, to make sure I finished in a good, in sort of in the way I'd wanted to. Um, and I'd have been too excited to sleep if I'd gone to bed anyway. But actually arriving at the South Pole was n- nothing. And I actually, I actually skied down there. And there's um, this the, the ceremonial pole, and then there's the actual geographic South Pole, which moves a little bit every year because it's the ice moves. So it was 100, 200 metres away. And I skied over to what I thought was it, but it's kind of an unprepossessing little white sign. Phoned the logistics company and said, stop the clock, I'm there, I think. <laughs> and so it definitely wasn't as climactic and you know, just momentous as the actual moment when I when I saw the South Pole it was just indescribably good yeah I'm so proud of you I'm so so proud of you I mean it's incredible what you've achieved absolutely fantastic how are you coping now coming back to coming back to the UK you've completed this dream Uh, adventure blues are they happening for you is is your life gone back to normal does it seem like a, a dream which happened a long time ago maybe a bit of all of those things actually so a good friend of mine said you know what the world hasn't changed but you've changed and it's almost about trying to find your position where where the shape that you've left is not the one that you slot back into and I have definitely changed the person I had so much self-doubt and even though everybody else believed in me they were like oh you're gonna smash this you know you're amazing and I'm so so grateful to all those people that kind of sent all that morale and and they all knew that I could do it, but I didn't know myself. And that self-belief and that self-confidence has, is just really given me a massive boost. And um, it definitely has changed who I am as a person. It's, it's made me feel like scarily invincible, like anything is possible. So coming back to the kids and the family and loved ones was just amazing. And, you know, all the little things like doing the school run and, spending time with them just kind of chilling out I really really appreciate that even now and just little things like because I didn't sit down for 42 days so sitting in a chair was quite a novel experience for a while and turning the tap on and water comes out and all those things that that we just don't appreciate a lot of the time maybe maybe more so now but usually we just you know you take a lot of things for granted and appreciating all the little things night skies even rain you know even gray wintry days when I got back were still something that I was you know really happy to see and so definitely there was a bit of that talking about the expedition actually trying to do something with the legacy of it so that's kind of become what I'm working towards now because I think if you just have a cliff edge where you come back from something and you just that's it there's a sort of hard stop and you don't have any plans then I think that could be when you have a lot of post-expedition blues so I think what's helped me and what's been really important for me is still having a plan about what I'm going to do next what I'd like to do next what I'm going to do with the expedition so I'm doing a lot of talks in schools and in companies about the lessons I learned about success and bravery and you know how you can achieve those kind of seemingly impossible things over such a long period of time and actually actually make them happen because I'm I tell you now I'm not a big complete finisher and uh you know this this has been as important for me to make me proud of myself actually kind of completing it as you know has been for sort of proving anything to anybody else or making sponsors happy or anything it's definitely been a a journey into the the depths of my kind of physical mental limits so it's been an interesting process since I got back but I've definitely got plans I'm gonna mix things up now I'm gonna be asking you some quick fire questions so my answers may be quick but your answers don't have to be are you ready yes Okay, are you a morning person or an evening person? Oh, definitely a morning person. I'm not great at massively early starts. Five o'clock is still night time to me. But as soon as I'm up, I'm ready to go and I'm on the go all day. And then I sort of crash and burn at about nine, half nine and fast asleep. Then. What time does your alarm go off? It depends on what I'm doing. But um, if I'm not doing, if I didn't have an early training session, it would be, you know, six, half six, something like that. But no, nothing ridiculous. But if I was doing a an early training session to fit it in around work, then 5am. So not a good time for me. <laughs> 
do you have a morning routine well I guess because I've still got a full-time job and kids to get to school so yeah my my morning routine is breakfast pack the kids off try not to forget anything get them to school go to work and uh, sometimes I cycle but you know I did honestly wonder how much I'd cycle to work when I didn't have to for my training and it definitely hasn't been quite as much as it uh, as it was beforehand are you a tea or coffee person oh both although I had no no tea or coffee on the expedition because they're obviously diuretics and and it's a luxury it's extra weight it doesn't add anything it's no calories and so yeah I had um 40 odd days off coffee and uh, I was pretty sensitive to it when I got back but I've increased my tolerance now do you have a favorite movie yes it's called Leon I don't know if you if you've seen it um it's about a uh I was going to say, is that about uh, an assassin? Uh, yes, it's about an assassin, but he has um, he strikes up a quite sort of unexpected, unconventional friendship with this little girl, who I think is played by Natalie Portman. And it's actually got really, it's a really beautiful story, even though it's quite violent. It's Luc Besson who did, uh, what else did he do? Uh, that one, Lucy, about the the extraordinary sort of brain capacity of a of a woman, and he's he's quite quirky. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of his of his work. What about a favourite book? What book are you reading or listening to at the moment? I'm reading an amazing book. I, it's, uh, I think it's called Wild Women and it's by it's edited by Mariella Frostrop and it's excerpts from the stories of different women who've gone off and done like Vita Sackville West and Amelia Earhart and it's just brilliant. I mean, I know they'll have picked the best bits but uh, Amelia Earhart in particular is a, a huge hero and inspiration of mine and uh you know some of the things I can't remember any quotes off the top of my head but it's a nice thick book so that you can kind of dip into so perfect for me because I you know I was kind of juggling and and flying from one thing to another like uh, I suppose a lot of us are these days so um yeah that's that's definitely what's on my uh, uh bedside table at the moment what about music? Do you have a favourite band, favourite genre, favourite song, favourite album? I have really, like, appalling taste in music. <laughs> really cheesy. Either cheesy pop like Britney Spears or early Miley Cyrus. And then, and then like, some weird things like Cypress Hill and Red Hot Chili Peppers thrown in there as well. So just a real, a real random mixture. But I, when I was away, I just had not enough and not enough good stuff and I was listening to some of it thinking why the hell have you downloaded why is this on your library this is terrible (laughs) you know even even for me so um yeah I don't think you'd I'd be embarrassed to share my music collection with anyone are you more of a beach person or a mountain person oh mountain person without question I'm not big into you know I haven't done a lot of mountaineering I don't live near many mountains but the idea of lying on a beach with nothing to do sounds like torture and I don't really unsurprisingly I don't really like being too hot so definitely a mountain over a beach any day. What about food? What is your favourite food that you eat at home? And what was your favourite food while on an expedition? I have really simple pleasures when it comes to food. Tea and toast is what I definitely fantasised about. And what I just, yeah, that's my absolute kind of go-to thing when I'm hungry or because I need a treat or because I'm snuggling up in front of the TV. Um, and, uh, you know, nursery food like jacket potato, cheese and beans, definitely nothing kind of to gastronomic and what's the other question sorry what's your favorite food when you're on expedition oh so I always use expedition foods and they've been extremely good to me so they have a fairly limited range of vegetarian thousand calorie meals which is what I was eating so I think I have three or four in rotation but that is fine that didn't bother me one iota so my favorite was fish and potato pie and it was just amazing it was like the days I had that I could have eaten eaten it four times over and if I had that every single day I'd have been happy so yeah I think uh, I think I need to stock up just for in general <laughs> what do you do to rest and relax I'm very bad at resting and relaxing I have to be doing something self-improving if I'm resting relaxing so I just don't generally because if I sit down I fall asleep so resting and relaxing for me counts as things like going for a run or going for a bike ride or doing some sort of research on or reading a kind of relevant book to polar travel. There's, I don't really do resting. <laughs> what are the words that you live by? I think consistency and excellence of habit can really take you places. And it does, you know, it does pay dividends. And given the fact that I had, you know, no experience no money and you know no time but with with enough consistency you can chip away at something and yeah it does become it becomes a big thing and actually do, doing that every single day and I think that can actually you can actually change quite dramatically so I would never really people talk about you know you're an inspirational adventure and I literally can't I just don't see myself in that way but 
actually I should kind of try and see myself how I am now rather than how I've sort of always been if you see what I mean and I just I think expeditions no matter how no matter how small can change who you truly are and so I'm, I'm a big advocate for the Youth Adventure Trust who I support supported with the expedition fundraise for and and volunteer for for that reason because I've seen how much of a difference it's made to me and to my life and uh, you know even even just starting small and then building on that with that consistency can can add up to big rewards. Can you see yourself going back to to the pole again would you like to? There's something about Antarctica I really thought that it would get it out of my system and that this was this one big thing and after that, I'd never talk about going on expedition again. And, you know, I'd stay at home and it would all be kind of back to normal. But there's something that draws you to that place. And I, I think everybody that's been to Antarctica that I've spoken to has experienced something similar. And I would, I, I think I've been back six days and I thought, you know what, I've just got to get back there. And there are lots of potential things that I'm interested in doing there. There are a couple of journeys which have yet to be done by a woman. But obviously getting to Antarctica is it is expensive so you know I'm not now I've got to go or it's the end of the world it's more like I would absolutely love it because you know it's such a privilege to go there at all that I'd be very very lucky if I if I got to go back but yeah I can't I can't pretend that it hasn't got us this kind of obsessive hold over me that everything is about Antarctica and getting back there for sure. Wendy where's the best place for people to find more information out about you and to follow along with your journey? At the moment, most of what I'm doing is on my Instagram page, which is at Between Snow and Sky. I do have a website, which is southpole2020.com. Obviously, that's going to eventually become a little bit out of date. So I'm thinking again about what I might do next with the exhibition. But that's certainly where I'm putting everything for now on Instagram and on on that website. So please um, come and say hi. And if you've got kind of exhibition questions about Antarctica, I can tell you about my experience because I really want to you know share that with anybody that's thinking of going and um try and kind of yeah definitely encourage you to go for sure Wendy I'd love for you to leave you know our listeners with final words of advice final words of wisdom from what you've learned about having this dream and going after it and you know achieving it what words would you like to leave our listeners with it was such a huge effort for me and for my family Everybody who I know has ended up being drawn into it. It cost me, as well as all the amazing sponsors that I've had, it cost me a huge amount of money with the training and the trips and the kit. But for all of that, for all of the hard work and all the sacrifice and the early starts and the the lying in cold rivers and all the other things that went into it, it was 100% worth it. Wendy, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast. It's been absolutely inspiring to catch up with you. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. And I can't wait to see what you get up to next. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. I hope you enjoyed the episode with Wendy. I always think it's fantastic when we can go back and catch up with our previous guests to see what they have been up to. So if you haven't listened to the first episode with Wendy, I'd highly recommend you go back and take a listen. You can find more about Wendy's backstory, how she, why she decided she wanted to go to the South Pole, her motivation, her training, and basically fill in all of the gaps of the stuff that we haven't talked about today. So I didn't mention it at the start, but my name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl Podcast and the Tough Girl Podcast Extra. Everything that we've talked about today will be available at toughgirlchallenges.com which is basically like the main central hub so please do go check it out and from the main website you can find links to the tough girl challenges facebook page uh, my personal instagram account my twitter account the youtube channel as well as links to the patreon account which is how you can support the podcast and help me to produce this content so you can also go and visit patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash tough girl podcast just want to give you a couple of podcast recommendations especially if you're interested in polar exploration and polar travel then we've spoken to a number of different polar explorers so go and take a listen to Anne Daniels Uh, we've spoken with Felicity Aston Uh, Wendy also mentioned Molly Hughes we're going to be getting Molly back on the Tough Girl podcast extra in the next couple of weeks to talk about her South Pole challenge but we've had Molly on the Tough Girl podcast previously who shared so Molly has actually was the youngest 
English woman to climb Mount Everest from both sides, so from the north and south side. So she shares more about that on the last interview that we did with her. You can take a listen to Chris Chris Fagan, who did the South Pole with her husband. And we also spoke with Maria Legisnam, who is a Welsh-British polar adventurer, who was the first person to cycle to the South Pole from the edge of the continent, which she did in 2013. All of them are absolutely fascinating stories. Well, they all are fascinating stories. These are incredible women um, doing incredible things. So just want to say a massive thank you to everybody who's written a review for the Tough Girl podcast or told one friend about the Tough Girl podcast. It makes such a massive difference in spreading awareness and helping to increase the amount of female role models in the media. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, have an awesome day. Give it your all. I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another episode of the Tough Girl podcast. All right, take care. Lots of love. Bye.